On Blues Radio International, it's Jesse and Audrey at the 2022 Blues Music Awards in Memphis. That's right, Jesse. And it is absolutely wonderful to be sitting here this morning with Jack Sullivan of Blues Music Magazine, kicking off our 2022 Memphis sessions, a blues historian and friend of the blues. Good morning, Jack. How are you? Wonderful, Jesse. We're in my hometown here now of Memphis, so it's fabulous. Thanks for having me. Well, thank you for joining us. Uh, I think we focus on the performers so often, and obviously the players are the people we all come to see. But there are historians along the way who make sure that this music is documented, that the stories behind the songs are told, and the important history of the music is there. And that's something that we all owe you a debt of gratitude for. Can you tell us how long you've been working on the magazine and uh, how it's developed into where it is today? We started the magazine in 2012. And so we've been at it for almost nine years. We just released our 33rd issue and we're a quarterly magazine. So about nine years. Um, and it's been a lifelong journey with the blues, but the magazine has been out for about nine years now. So we were talking earlier about how you started out focused on jazz in New York. What's the evolution of your coming to the blues and how did it become such an important part of your life? I said I wasn't going to cry now, and you're talking about B.B. King. B.B. King was my entrance into the blues in New York City at the Avery Fisher Hall. A friend of mine, I was 16 years old, invited me to a show. Uh, and he said, if you like jazz, you're going to like this guy. And we took the train from the Bronx down to Lincoln Center for the Avery Fisher Hall. And uh, he kind of told me about B.B. King's background, where he grew up, how hard it was. And I was 16 years old and living on the streets in New York City. And B.B. Uh, put on an amazing show. And I just remember leaving that show and going, you know, if he can make something in his life, I can too. And uh, I became a blues guy. Well, now, how did you get from becoming a blues guy at that age to actually publishing the magazine? You know, I worked in, I worked with Hearst Corporation, Randolph Hearst, Patty Hearst. Uh, I worked with the Hearst Corporation in circulation sales for Cosmo, Glamour, Bogue, Mademoiselle, Time, TV Guide, all of those for 34 years. Uh, I started out as a salesperson on the telephone selling subscriptions uh, back when telemarketing was you know, before it was the nastiness that it became and uh, moved up into a circulation director to running offices and becoming an executive with the company and worked with several other companies. But always in all of my corporate travels, the blues was there. You know, typically I would travel corporately Monday through Friday to train offices in Phoenix or New York or Chicago. And I'd told my boss I'm spending the weekend I'll be home to the office on Monday because I'm going to contact the Blues Society and find out where the blues is and um, so when I decided to leave that industry because I saw it was the problems they were having in 2006 and 7 and 8 and magazines were closing I decided you know what could I do well let's make a magazine and that's where Blues Music, Mag blues Music Magazine started in this hotel he really? came to the Blues Music Awards that year, Art Paul the Nine. He said, Blues Review is closing, another magazine that existed. And uh, all the writers and photographers love what you're doing, so they'd like to work with you. And I drove home from here to Florida and went, sure, we have no money. Let's start a magazine. <laughs> and tell me what it's like actually publishing a physical magazine in the world today, because everyone's reading on their iPhones or whatever, and... Uh, we, you know, physical magazines obviously are an important part of documenting our history, but there are so few of them left. How hard is that to do today? It's tremendously rewarding, Jesse, um, in the sense of you get to hold it physically in your hand. The people who appear in it adore that they're appearing in print. Um, publishing it is a whole nother ball game. You know, um, the writers elected me to be the publisher of the magazine after a year and a half or two years. They said, you know, that's your job. And when I looked it up, publisher is the guy who goes and finds the money to make it happen. And it's always challenging uh, in this pandemic era. 
you know, with supply chain slowdowns, we've had 11 paper increases. The new, the previous, you know, establishment put a guy in charge of the post office and we ship a lot of copies through the post office, about 14,000 of them, every issue. So consequently, you know, we've had five paper increases in the last year. Uh, I'm with the number one printer in America, Quad, and they're a $4 billion company. They handle all of the top magazines out there. And they had a, they, just recently we had a Zoom call. There was over 800 publishers and staff on the Zoom call concerned about the price increases and the fact that the previous administration of this country really doesn't like the press and would like to put them out of business. So it's very challenging to make sure that we have the revenue, but also the content needs to be told. The stories are important. I've always been a story lyricist guy. I love the lyrics to the songs. I love the music, but I love the lyrics. So I have no choice. I'm committed. <laughs> What's the evolution? I mean, you're celebrating a 10-year anniversary here, uh, as are we. We're celebrating our 11th this year. Yep. Um, so we all started these projects at the same time. What's the evolution of the blues been since you first started documenting it in 2012? There have been a lot of changes. Yes, um, you know, and especially with the magazine. We started out as a feature magazine, uh, and we were doing six to eight features per issue. Going into issue 34, we're looking at doing five features and more CD reviews because page count has diminished because there is a serious, serious paper shortage in America, uh, especially for magazine-type paper. Um, in the last year, it's gone up $16 per hundred weight. So what we paid $42 for last year, we're paying $58 for this year. And we use several hundred pounds of paper. So we've had to cut back to a 68 page magazine compared to an 84 page magazine. When we had six or eight features, now we're cutting back to five, uh, which is sad because we're quarterly and we like to get the stories out, you know, about the artist. You know, and I'll give you a quick one here, if you don't mind. Not we get these kind of stories. Our writers are very experienced. Many of them have won the Keeping the Blues Alive Award for journalism. Our photographers have won the Keeping the Blues Alive for photography. And here's a for instance of a story. We speak with Kev Moe. Everybody wants to know about his new album, what's going on, blah, blah, blah. We went back. Kev, so tell us how it all began. And Keb said, well, I was in high school, I was in the auto shop, and I was going to be an auto mechanic. That was my life dream and my father's life dream. And um, one day I came to class, and my teacher at the shop said, go upstairs. I want you to go to the auditorium. And I was like, what did I do wrong? And he's like, you didn't do anything. There's a musician there. I'd like you to hear him. And he went up, you know, in Compton High School, where he lived in Compton, California, and he went up to hear this musician play and he came back and saw his teacher to thank him and he said that was really great he goes good go see him again tomorrow well after he saw him the second time he went home and told his father i think i want to get a guitar and that's where it all began for keb mo and that musician was of course taj mahal doing a blues in the school that's the kind of stories we look for in our magazine that's what sets us apart is finding that the beginning point, the truth. Where did it all begin and where is it all now? And then 50 years later, of course, Taj Mahal and Kev Mo do an album and form a band called Taj Mo, which we've been waiting 50 years for them to do, <laughs> you know. Well, it's great. And we wouldn't have those backstories or right. that history. And there's also a risk of losing it as our, our population ages. Uh, some of these things will not accompany their music unless they're documented. Right. What is your observation on how the music has changed over the last 10 years, Jack? A lot of the originators are gone. A lot of the guys who started these styles of music have passed away in the last 10, 12 years. And so the new guys are carrying it forward, but they're evolving it. Like the local band we have here, Memphis Sippy Sounds, great band. Uh, and they have evolved into what I've always thought should happen is this country roots blues with hip-hop 
and being from, you know, South Bronx and East Harlem, you know, I grew up not far from where they started hip hop. So consequently, I've always thought it's just an evolution of the blues music to go down that road. And uh, pretty much that's where it's kind of going with a lot of bands these days. And, and blues rock has, you know, become much bigger uh, in the last 10 years than it was, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Now, there are purists who would say you're deviating from the path when you go to hip hop where you become more Americana or you become too much rock and roll. Tell me what, about it. What's, so how do you deal with that? I'm sure you get some feedback from folks who oh, yeah. have those opinions. And uh, how I, do you confront that? I couldn't that? tell you the amount of emails we get from people going, that's not blues. And I go, okay, well, blues is a big house and it has a lot of rooms for soul and gospel and R&B and blues rock and country blues and hip hop. And the hip hop one is the one they start yelling at me about. <laughs> but to me, hip hop is blues from the ghetto, you know, but it's an inner city ghetto. So, you know, we had ghettos down south in Mississippi back in the day, cotton fields, and now we have ghettos in New York City that they have music and they have sound and it's an important sound, all of it. And interbreeding it together, just a natural evolution as far as I'm concerned. Here's something that I know you're focused on, as we all are. The demographics of the audience that listens to traditional blues music is on the older end. Some people almost as old as you and me. Yeah. Even older. <laughs> Even older. <laughs> and what do you see as the, the safe path, the future of the blues? Because we need to reach younger audiences and we need to spread the word and have this expand beyond its traditional base. Social media is very important for that. Uh, we have about 50,000 fans on our Facebook page. And according to their analytics, we're at 50% under 50 years old and 50% over 50 years old. So we have targeted that. We've directed our marketing towards a younger audience and towards an older audience also. We, we, we tend to work with both of them. Um, because we know in order to continue and survive, you need to bring, and that's why I think there's a lot of younger musicians now who kind of get the blues. My own son just turned 32 and has been a guitar player for 12 years, and he's like, if you don't, he, he came home one day, and he had an Airstream, an airline guitar, and he walked in with this different shaped case, and I said, what did you do? He was 16. And he said, I traded in my guitar, my airline, my rock and roll punk rock airline for this other guitar. And he opened it up and it was an ES-345. And he said, I guess I got to learn the blues to be a rock and roller. And he's right. A lot of the younger musicians get it. We here in Memphis are blessed to have people like Matt Wilson and Max Kaplan and, you know, Danny Banks and all of these great young musicians coming up. And they get it. I mean, they understand. It's great to see John Hay walk up to the microphone and go, I'm going to knock out a little number here from uh, Earl King. And we go, that's right. You know, so they get it. And stepping into the future, you're talking about social media and the online presence for Blues Music Magazine. What is next for Blues Music Magazine, say, coming up in 2022, 2023? The biggest thing that we're doing now is we're releasing our content from the past. Now that we have a catalog, we're starting to really push the content out and we're targeting people in social media advertising. We're targeting the younger demographic. So we're putting our reviews of albums up there. We're putting our stories. We're putting our photography. We're putting, you know, information about bands, all of our advertisers. When you look at our social media page, con different from other magazines, I don't mind putting the content out there because I know if people like it, they're going to come and get it anyway, and they want to get it first. So consequently, that's one of the things we have just started doing this year is really pushing our content out, but paying to advertise to younger people. And it's really, really, really paying off. Um, it, it's really exciting to see the younger people get excited. We get letters all the time from the older fans, from fans my age at 68, 69 years old. But when the younger fans start calling up and going, you mean I can call and just buy the music and you ship it to me? 
And we're like, yeah, and you get 10% off too for calling. And they're like, I love this place, you know, and it's great that they're starting to learn and they're open, you know, like, oh, I've never heard of that guy. What's he like? And they want to learn more. They're just like we were, Jesse, when we started. You know, when I first heard One Way Out, it was by the Allman Brothers, thank God. But that's not who did it originally. And I was working at Cousins Record Store in the Bronx, and the owner went, oh, you think that's good? Listen to this. And I went, who is that? They wrote this? Yeah. And that's what's happening today with the younger generation is that discovery process. You know, the doors are opening. One door leads to another. And you talk about the evolution and we were discussing hip hop as part of the blues. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I don't think a lot of the young people today realize is that the sampling and the background music for a lot of hip hop is taken from blues, soul, R&B and gospel. Right. A lot of the tracks that people were spinning back in the day were Albert King, Freddie King, cats like that because that music had some bounce to it and they were able to put some words over the top of it especially the guitar leads, things like that, you know, and getting to know the guys from Run DMC back in the late 70s and early 80s when they toured with ZZ Top, you know, getting to see that evolution from those guys um, and, and where it's come today. It, it's just, it's amazing because they will tell you, oh, no, we love the blues, you know, but we play this. This is our blues, you know, and I'm okay with that. Yeah, they definitely, with, with blues, it has taken a lot of directions. And do you think that Blues Music Magazine would ever be doing a feature, say, on an Americana or hip-hop band? Absolutely. Okay. We have a big house with a lot of rooms. A lot of rooms. And, and we do that all the time. And we hear about it all the time. Very nice. From some of our purists, as you say. Yeah, there definitely seems to be a school of thought out there that thinks that blues should be specific to one sound. Right. And unfortunately for them, that's not how blues is. So, sound evolves. Exactly. Exactly. So I think that it's wonderful that you're exposing blues fans to other options, which is something they may not get with a very targeted thing that you have on social media you don't really get a lot of options yeah when we put little stevie on the cover steven van zandt yeah art said i said art we're gonna have some issues but we both really wanted little steven on the cover because of his background and the stories we could tell and i said we're gonna get some controversy over this so we need to tell the story in your column and in the feature and when little steven talks about you know, him and his friend driving out into the middle of New Jersey to catch a cat named Holland Wolf, who's so big that the harmonica looks like a, a Pez container in his hand. And on the way home, him and Southside Johnny from the Asbury Jukes, who he was with and roommates at the time, are going, we're going to be the white Jan and Dean or Sam and Dave. You know, this is what we're going to be. We want to play this music. And that's where they started, and he really is a blues guy, you know. And we also told the story about his helping with apartheid and the foundation he set up with money for apartheid. Are you familiar with that one? Yes. Yeah, he raised over a million dollars to uh, contribute to the legal fund of the guy who became the president after 25 years in prison in South Africa. That's amazing story. And he's a blues man. That's wonderful. <laughs> Jack. Thank you for devoting so much of your life to not only helping the musicians and the fans, but to documenting this important history of the blues. You're an important part of not only the blues community, but now blues history. We're honored to have you here, and thank you for joining us on Blues Radio International. It's my honor. Thank you all for doing what you do. Thank you.